Laura Polk begged the police to do their job. She knew that something wasn't right with the Sunday school teacher, Melissa Huckabee. Her seven-year-old daughter returned from a Sunday afternoon with Melissa. She had taken her without Laura's permission to Wendy's. Her daughter said she'd given her water that tasted like it had medicine in it. She couldn't remember anything after she drank the water. On January 17th, she had to report her daughter missing to the police. Police and the people in the community looked throughout the Orchard Estate Mobile Home Park for the missing girl. Melissa would return four hours later with her daughter. Laura says her daughter was a little bit on the emotional side and tired, but she was just happy that she was home and safe. Later on, Laura would take her daughter to McDonald's to buy her a Happy Meal, but she noticed the seven-year-old was nodding off in the car. She was slumped over with slurred speech it really scared her. She headed to the emergency room at the local hospital. She waited for hours. What was going on with her daughter? What did Melissa do to her daughter? The police were now at the hospital. They told her her daughter had been drugged with muscle relaxers. They were found in her bloodstream. There was only one person that could have done this, Melissa Huckabee. The police thought it was Laura Polk that had drugged her daughter. Laura's past was going to come into play. She's been in trouble before, involved with drug abuse. She ended up losing a daughter because of that in 1994, and she hadn't seen that daughter since. But she's been getting her life back together. She had a 22-year-old son and an 18-year-old daughter at this time. There is no way she would have given her seven-year-old muscle relaxers. She admitted at the hospital to the police that she had drank a beer that night when they told her that her breath smelled of alcohol. Then they asked if they could search her home and they searched her home, the home she shared with her parents. Authorities had taken Laura's daughter overnight. The police questioned Melissa, but nothing was said, nothing was done, nothing happened. Laura told Melissa she never wanted to speak to her again. Laura's daughter was returned to her the next day. She would ask more questions about what happened that afternoon with the Sunday school teacher, trying to figure out what Melissa had done. The only thing she remembered was going to three different parks with Melissa and her daughter, Madison, which was her daughter's friend as well. Around that time, the Polk family kept the little girl in the house at all times and away from the Sunday school teacher. A while later in that same trailer park, an eight-year-old girl would go missing, Sandra Renee Cantu. Laura told the police to question Melissa Huckleby. All the male sex offenders within the trailer park or a certain radius of the trailer park were questioned and questioned again and had alibis. A criminal profiler had said that the man who abducted Laura was a white male between 25 to 40 years old. The Chavez Cantu family were on the nightly news, begging, pleading, praying for the safe return of Sandra. Missing person flyers with Sandra's pretty face draped the trailer park. A year prior, a man had tried to kiss Sandra on the lips at the park. He was known as getting a little too friendly with the young ones. He was questioned, but he had an airtight alibi. And not only was Laura Polk trying to convince police to speak with Melissa, Melissa was trying to help with the police too. When Sandra went missing, she was hyperventilating, crying, extremely upset. She was taking it extremely hard. Granted, her daughter was very good friends with Sandra. Laura didn't trust this woman at all. Visuals were held for Sandra Cantor. Days went by. No word on where Sandra was. A $20,000 reward for Sandra's whereabouts were offered. Tips were pouring in, no leads. There was one tip that may have been valid. 
that the police were going to look into. Jose Franco had witnessed a woman coming out the woods. She said she was using the bathroom. He was there working on the dairy farm near the irrigation pond, and he knew no one was supposed to be there. He also noticed a suitcase was in the pond. Everything seemed suspicious to him. He called in his tip, not even knowing that there was an award. At the same time, Melissa was helping the police. She'd given the police a letter that she found. It was handwritten, misspelled words on notebook lines paper saying where Sandra's body could be located in a suitcase thrown at the Pachati and White Hill Road. Melissa was like Columbo, giving all her tips to help find this missing girl. Columbo, still on the case, texted Maria Chavez, Sandra's mother. She told her around 4 p.m. she had a $200 Eddie Bauer suitcase that was stolen off her porch. She didn't know if it made a difference, but maybe she should inform the police. By this time, the police and a search crew were able to retrieve that suitcase. Sandra was found inside. Sandra was not coming home. The family of Sandra Cantu were told first before it hit the news and the world. Of course, they had taken it hard, screaming out in pain and anguish. Why would anyone want to kill the suitcase had been stolen from Melissa's home that, ironically, she shared with her parents and six-year-old daughter, Madison. Laura Polk had told her daughter that attended school with Sandra, that Sandra was safe now, that she's in heaven. The autopsy reports would read, Sandra had been drugged, beaten, brutally sexually assaulted and strangled and then stuffed in the suitcase. Melissa was brought in for questioning at the police station. Before she inserted herself into this investigation, she wasn't even on the police radar. A Sunday school teacher that taught the Bible to little kids at her grandfather's church. She was a divorcee with a young daughter who was good friends with Sandra. She denied, 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 and then finally She would first tell the police that Sandra was playing in her suitcase and locked herself in and suffocated. She was scared and dumped her in the water. The Sunday school teacher shown on CCC camera had driven past Sandra while she walked around the trailer park looking for her friends. She had told an easy lie just to get her in the car. Then she had taken Sandra to the church, where she drugged her with Xanax, sexually assaulted her with a rolling pin, beat her, strangled her, and stuffed her in the suitcase. That's where she was caught by Jose Franco. Almost 10 days later, Sandra's body was found. The Clover Church was searched. The cords from the blinds inside the church was used to help close the suitcase. The bent bloody pin that Melissa used to sexually assault her was still in the church. The blood, the DNA, would prove later that it was Sandra's blood. The note Melissa found and handed to police matched the same notebook paper that was found in her home. Melissa had been known for drugging people. She had also drugged an ex-boyfriend. And if you asked Laura Polk, she drugged her brother too. The investigators couldn't believe that a woman, and only a woman, was behind this heinous crime. A man wasn't forcing her to do this. She did it, and only because she wanted to. Melissa was arrested and placed in solitary confinement. We know that other prisoners aren't too fond of child predators. The world was watching. It was a sigh of relief that someone had been caught. And yes, many were still shocked. It was a woman. Johnny Huckleby was shocked the most. 
Melissa's husband of one year. He said she changed. That was not the person that he knew. He knew that she had some kind of depression. She took medicine for it. He said that in the divorce papers, she lied. And she said that there was abuse. He said it wasn't. The interviewer asked him, where was Madison, the daughter that he shared with Melissa? He just answered that Madison was safe. I'm sure I wasn't the only one that wondered if Melissa had drugged her own daughter at some point. She was too young to know or remember. And then she decided to venture out the trailer park and find new victims. In court, Maria Chavez and Daniel Cantu, Sandra's parents, and other family members had to sit in the courtroom and see and hear this monster speak. They would speak after showing a beautiful tribute through pictures. She wanted to be a nurse. Her mother will always wonder if she would have ever became a nurse. All they had now was the pictures of Sandra Renee Cantu's short seven years of living, a life cut short by a woman who was a neighbor, a friend, part of the community, someone who was trusted, a mother, a Sunday school teacher. Maria Chavez says she has no forgiveness for her daughter's killer. I wonder how she feels today. Forgiveness isn't really for them, it's for you, that's what they say. But until you lost a child in a tragic way, as she did, you can't judge. We're supposed to forgive her enemies. But I don't even know what to consider her, to be honest with you. There ain't nothing that happens today gonna change. There's nothing gonna change. Lie. I don't believe that I'm in my heart. I should hate. It took the life of an innocent little girl, and she didn't do nothing. She's not even old enough to decide to eat ice cream yet. I stand at my job, and nothing changes, and nothing's going to change the fact whether I cry. She changed the lives of a lot of people. A lot of people. But for the families. We still have on everything. How we express it, everyone has their own personality. Everyone is their own individual. All I can say right now is, repent and think about what you've done. I'm sorry. I'd like to apologize directly to Maria 
The entire speech was about her. I don't believe she was sorry. She was only sorry she was caught and everyone knew that it was her. She couldn't fool the police anymore like she has successfully done in the past over and over again. She wanted to make it clear that she didn't sexually assault Sandra, afraid that her cellies might find out and what they might do. That was the point of drugging these children to be able to do whatever she wanted to do to them without them remembering. This was all premeditated. It could have been the other young girl at the Trello Park. Who's to say nothing happened with her? That poor little girl was so drugged, she couldn't even remember. Who else did Melissa give spiked water to, to have her way with? Or was she just getting started? Melissa thought that she was smarter than everyone. Melissa Huckleby would receive 25 years to life with no parole. Laura Polk received an apology from the police and I have to echo her sentiment. If they had have thoroughly investigated her daughter's case, Sandra would be alive today. She would be 21 years old in the year 2023. Remembering Sandra Renee.